Okay, I I am gonna be I'm not gonna share the screen uh, because uh, it's it's all uh, just excuse me for one second. Uh, my name is Asma Akram. I'm one of the anesthetic doctor, and currently I'm in um, UK uh, in pediatric anesthesia. I, this uh, this tutorial or lecture is all gonna be just verb. Uh, I, it's not slides because there's loads of material which Dr. Zishan has shared with you already in the forms of articles and presentations and flashcards. So I would like to be it more interactive. It's possible if if the people who can turn on their cameras can turn on their cameras and they can raise your hand or unmute yourself if you want to ask something. Okay, we will be doing a I will be asking in between and I would like you to uh, participate it. Otherwise, there's no point of just me talking and talking. And uh, I, I won't, uh, this is very difficult in a virtual meeting. Like you can't see other people and you don't know if you are, if the, the people are getting your point. So if it's okay, whoever can turn on their cameras, I would like to, it's, it's, it's up to you. So basically, the as I said, I'm working in pediatric anesthesia. So I offer like I just thought that I can contribute on pediatric side of the things. And um, uh, doc, as I said, Dr. Zishan has shared. There is a uh, folder in the drive in which they are different topics regarding the pediatric anesthesia are discussed. So we are starting with the pediatric emergencies. I'll be doing pediatric airway emergencies only today, okay? And then inshallah, we'll, I'll try carrying on and hopefully we'll be uh, covering different pediatric emergencies and different other pediatric topics one by one. Uh, so, okay, so if everybody, as we know, or everybody will know, we all are in uh, pediatric, uh, we have like uh, done some anesthesia. I suppose, and we are reading as well, if they are reading for exams and stuff. So we know that the pediatric airway, basically uh, the base of the pediatric airway emergency is, is that the, the uh, pediatric airway is different than the adult airway in anatomical and physiological ways. So we all know that they have large tongues, they have large head, they have narrow airway, in, nasal passages, their glottis is anterior, and these th those things. So basically all these physiological and anatomical differences, what they are making pediatric patients prone to is rapid desaturation, reduced oxygen reserve, and difficult anatomical visualization while we are doing the laryngoscopy, or even even if even if you when you visit the website and see the DAS AV guidelines for the pediatric anesthesia, and it, there is a third scenario in which, uh, in addition to the card intubate, can't ventilate. There is a third scenario in which they have just discussed that how you improve the mask ventilation. So basically, the mask ventilation is technical and tricky in pediatric patients, especially in the neonates, and then it it, it goes on with uh, if there are some syndromes or anatomical variabilities and all those, because they can have some anatomical variabilities. There are, you all know the, from the exam point of view, there are a few syndromes which are associated with difficult airways like Colin Teacher syndrome and Golden Horse syndrome. So, and uh, some other things as well. So, so this is it. So, as I said, uh, so these all, the anatomical and physiological things are making it difficult for the child. And they are basically making it difficult for us to maintain the air. Okay. So uh, shall we, is, will, will be starting uh, how we are, is, is, that, is that okay? Can I, I, I know there are many people, uh, but we, we still have like 40, 45 minutes. Uh, can I know like, I, I, how many of you are uh, working in a pediatric setup? or have worked uh, in pediatric setup is, and would anybody would like to come forward and um, discuss anything and say anything about that? 
or if any recent pediatric airway emergencies they have dealt with? Any would like to say anything? Dr. Zishan, are you doing pediatric airway at the moment, like pediatric uh, hospital? Yes, actually, no, our hospital, everything uh, goes um, like not uh, advanced pediatrics uh, uh, surgery. That is a separate part. I'm not that part of that hospital. But otherwise, uh, the usual pediatric urology procedure, hypospadias and things like that, or every now and then uh, ENT cases and uh, some eye, eye surgeries, things like yes. that. So that not, is not basically a, as a as a uh, uh, exam student and as a practicing anesthetist this is what it is expected from us so we need to know a little bit i would say a basic of pediatric anesthesia even if we are exam in, in exams they are not asking they are not expecting a very specialized things from you and it's the same when you are working as a specialist and if you're working in any setups you should be able to handle uh, a initial you, you should be able to handle an uh, initial form of like pediatric AV emergencies like if, even if you are sitting in a peripheral hospital you can still get a child with a foreign body you can still get a child with epiglottitis you can still get a child with uh, you might not get a bleeding tonsil but you can try get you can easily get a child with a croup which he who, who's rapidly desaturating or getting respiratory distress okay so uh, as Dr. Zishan has said, like we are not doing a specialized pediatric, uh, he's not in a, like he's not doing specialized pediatric and aesthetic settings, but he can get somebody who needs to be resuscitated and can be, needs to be transferred over, okay? So I will go through the uh, pediatric airway emergencies one by one. Uh, the first one is very common exam question. And I don't know how many times it would have come in by, but probably not. It's not uh, because it, it is, this question has been there for like more than 50 years. That is a re respiratory tract infection. And like, what, what do you do if you come across a, a child or a baby uh, who, or who has been, who has, who had a respiratory tract infection recently? Okay, so the guidelines are there. I would always recommend you to get yourself updated on the recent things. Uh, and uh, as you know, recently, uh, the, the most common respiratory, like we are getting into the season of uh, more of the croup and bronchiolitis and all that, but COVID is still there. So they are like uh, the updated guidelines as we, I, I would like to just share a little bit that the COVID guidelines, they have said like, it's the same that you, uh, same as adult, like so somebody has a COVID, uh, they are not for elective surgery for the last, in the uh, in in six weeks time. They are postponing all the elective surgeries. They are not uh, doing COVID uh, test in the pediatric patients not anymore if they are asymptomatic. So this is one of the common respiratory tract infections. Say if the patient had a COVID in the last six to seven weeks, you would like to avoid any elective surgery. But yes, you 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 will come across when you have to deal with an emergency situation. So other things with the respiratory tract infection, the same is the thing. There is no fast, hard and fast rule. Any child who had any kind of viral respiratory tract infection in the last few weeks, so few weeks. It say the recommendation says four to six weeks that if the child had a viral respiratory tract infection, you would like to avoid the general anesthetic in that child in the next four to six weeks. But it happens a lot of the time. Some some kids are just asthmatic. Some kids are just with the persistent cough all the time. So what would you look for in those patients uh, that they are not sick? So the journal five questions, which you are going to ask in your practical anesthetic experience, and you are you can answer the same in your exams as well, is that the child is not sick, like the child is not, If is there any runny nose? If there is a runny nose, what is, if it's clear or it's yellow? Is the child is having cough? If it's chesty cough, it's dry cough. 
is the child if you would like to examine the child is the child having any peace is there any crackles in the chest is the child is feverish and if 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 is on a, a, in any antibiotics sometimes the kids are like it's very general in pakistan and in, in here as well in our setup that uh, the kid, the the general practitioners they just put the child on uh, antibiotics anyway if especially if they know the child they're coming for the surgery so you so all these questions really circulate around the thing that is your child in a good form a well form in a normal form or is your child disturbed so it just take it as a simple rule that is it uh, I, and I, that's what i do in my practice and as i said this question has been discussed a lot of times for the exam point of view that if my ch ch child is able to to eat and drink normally is if his child is in good form in like his inactive is not febrile the secretions are not yellowish and doesn't are not greenish and infected looking and he's not making any strange noises like a spider and croup uh, absolutely not if they are have spider or croup so you will go ahead and perform the surgery like you will perform the general anesthetic and what you need to be careful about is you would in in any pediatric anesthesia or in general anesthesia like you you know the the the, uh, the times of where the kids lay like, with the times of where there is extreme stimulus the light anesthesia like the emergence and the intubation are the areas where where the most of the uh, adverse airway events happen so you would like to not to instrument your uh, child's airway you would like to be them as deep as possible if you can like to have them and usually the it's the same like the uh, it, it it depends if you like to uh, what whatever you are more familiar with propofol or sevoflurane or uh, inhalational anesthetic or iv anesthetic whatever you are familiar with you can use and then there are you can in the exams as well you can discuss both things like what are the drawbacks or like what are the advantages which you are going to get with the propofol anesthesia and what are the advantages you are going to get with the sevoflurane anesthesia like with the sevoflurane you will be able to get them slowly deep you can will be able to uh, uh like if it's a sevoflurane it's not pungent and it's uh, so you can keep the spills uh, still the spontaneous circulation uh, spontaneous respiration with the iv propofol anesthetic what's happening is that you get, you get kind of get obtundation of the airway flexus so propofol is good in that case so you can manipulate your airway easily but the, they say i was just reading like it's it uh, they say it's better not to put a to do intubate like if if you can get away without intubation to intubating the child you should do that but it doesn't mean that you are if you are doing a procedure which needs intubation you can't say in an exam that i won't intubate the child so you have to do the child and i would like i i would really like to say like no secure the airway is no more confident and more easy you are in your chair when in sitting in the <coughs> so this is the more about the respiratory tract infection i would just like to if any would like to summarize something about that or if i'm going too fast and would like to say anything i think nobody is going to say anything here hello um, madam you are going good just is it very fast or are you able to uh, just, understand me uh, just a small question uh, dr asma which i actually uh, feel when usually when we are trying to to keep the patient for example either in face mask or we are trying to have supraglottic airway devices okay yeah. so of course we are not giving muscle relaxant yeah so in what my little experience that uh, these patients are prone to have more laryngospasm for some yes. reason so that's uh, that make it very tricky you are trying to avoid muscle relaxant you are putting uh, supraglottic or you are just trying to keep the patient on any surgery because uh, according to practical practical purposes uh, anyone can have any technique but in exam it is difficult to defend uh, not intubating a patient or not uh, at least putting supraglottic air, uh, airway device am i right yeah no so at least so say if so it's it's all the it, it's all question dependent actually so say if if your child is having so so as a general rule 
anybody who is under one of year of age in the plan purposes and in the practical purposes are for intubation anyway. Under one year, you are tubing the child, no matter what procedure you're going to do. So in the it's it's actually so so the, it's so uh, it's the same thing. Uh, I think so. Whatever question in in exam, what answer you are doing giving, you should be able to just defend your answer. So I think so. Ex examiners, and uh, until unless you are not saying completely wrong. So in even in exam, if you if you can say if you are saying your your patient was a grommet surgery and he had a recent uh, respiratory tract infection like four weeks ago. My child is not infected at the moment, and he he was waiting for the list for quite long. Uh, I would like to. So the, the first thing is that I would like to. So the, the so you can start the answer with the saying that the recommendations that you can postpone the surgery up to four to six weeks after the acute respiratory tract infection, and this is an elective surgery. So I would like to explain the parents. Explain. I would like to talk to my colleague, and I would like to postpone surgery. Okay, so this is one thing. Say if your examiner is a persistent, no, you have to do it. There. So that's what that's what they do. Like if they want to take you to that scenario, they would do that thing. So you can like, but what my point of view is that you need to defend your uh, answer. It's not a recommendation. It's still like if you want to avoid our airway. So it's the same thing. If you are not giving a muscle relaxant to a patient. And putting a tube, some like some, so it happens like you're not putting, you're not giving muscle relaxation in all all the times in pediatric anesthesia to put the tubes down. So, or you can say, okay, I I want to put secure the airway because the patient is at increased risk of uh, bronchospasm and laryngospasm. So I would use this and this, and I would put the tube down, and that's it. Okay, that's your uh, answer. And if you do, if you go by LMA. So you can defend that as well because uh, I, as you know, that in, in, there are anesthetists out there, and there are there is an article in pediatric anesthesia, in in which it it says that you can avoid you can try avoiding airway instrumentation, like try avoiding intubation if you think that the patient is at increased risk of spasm. But on the other side, yes, tubing is better if uh, if you think that your child is going to spasm. So it's better to spasm on the tube rather than on the elevator. So this is one thing. Uh, is yes, a, uh, I see Dr. Hanan has hands up. You can ask a question if you want to, or you want to contribute something. Hello, assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Hanan Akbar. And Hi. recently I'm working as a senior star in uh, pediatric anesthesia, Pakistan. I want to add something in the uh, LMA. The sir, Zishan has asked something about Without muscle relaxation, uh, there is a chance of laryngospasm and other things. Uh, according to exam, what's the ma'am is saying that it's already right. You have to defend your answer. But on practical purposes, every hospital has different protocols and they are going with uh, their uh, limited resources. As uh, uh, you said, you are not uh, intubating the patients. You have made some protocols that uh, there are some, we, we are not intubating the, we are not, uh, we will intubate the patients like uh, under less, uh, less than one year of age. But we are doing here is we have made some our own protocols that we avoid uh, like opioids uh, below 10 kg weight. We try to intubate the patients below 10 kg weight and uh, we try to avoid muscle relaxants in units. We uh, all, always try to avoid because uh, most probably we have not much resources and uh, but we predict that we have a hypothermia problem very much here so there is a prolongation of yeah. the delayed uh, recovery yeah. and other things as well so uh, but uh, uh, from the few years two to three years we already had sevoflurane we have uh, we didn't have any problem here when we had sevoflurane but now unfortunately it's yeah, not that's available I wanted to say yeah now uh, we are yeah, facing I can some problem you, from Dr. Two Anand. So I, 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 uh, I think so. Uh, so that's that's completely fine. So in exam, like it has happened to me actually. I would like to share that I in exam examiner asked some question, and I said, "Oh, if this is available, I would like to do this." So that's a very top tip for all of you who are preparing the, these things for the exam. Is that 
in exam, you have to assume that you have everything available and all the resources. The problem is that when, especially working in Pakistan, we come across, we are coming from the setups like I, I worked in pediatric anesthesia and children hospital as well, and we didn't have sevoflurane. We used IV inductions in all of the patients. And sevoflurane was reserved for a very selective uh, number of patients. So, but in exam, you can't say that, okay, I'm coming from the setup that in which the sevoflurane is not available at the moment, or in my hospital, the protocol is this. So in exam, when you are answering your question, you have to base your answer on the available evidence on the guidelines, okay? If you want to defend your answer, you can defend your answer by quoting that guideline, okay? That pediatric AVA guideline said that you can do this, okay? And then you have to assume that you have every, everything available, okay? You have sevoflurane available, you have IV available, you have LMAs available, you have tubes available, you have all kinds of supraglottic behavior available. Is that okay? So yes, ma'am. But I I wanted to conclude that uh, with LMA we are mostly doing the procedures of uh, lower limbs like uh, uh, hypospadias, hernia, and the procedures like that. We used to uh, uh, do the caudal block in the patients and uh, the inhalational agents both give a good response and we didn't have any problem like laryngeal spasm. We have faced and we have routine of using xylocaine uh, pre-intubation and uh, we are very safer in that and we have very good responses. Yeah, yes, that's that's good to know. Okay. So we'll come uh, towards the next two M AV emergencies, which are not basically in the anesthetic theater environment. Like you won't be coming across a child with a croup or epiglottitis. I'll fix it quickly. Okay something else that you won't be coming across with a, a child with a croup or a glottitis for a surgery so but you will be coming across a child with croup and epiglottitis for the exam point of view and if somebody if you are looking if you are sorry if you're working in a, a, a pediatric a, like even in the tertiary and in the periphery that the child can come with the respiratory distress. I won't go into the details of what is the medical management of croup and how do you manage it, but you need to know it from the exam point of view that what is the management for the croup and what is the management for the epiglottitis. I would just go through the things, the main few main points which are important from handling of the airway in a child who has a croup or epiglottitis. So as you know, the croup is basically a viral illnesses uh, viral illness and uh, um, and the epiglottitis can be both viral and bacteria. And you will see in uh, more in the epiglottitis that you will see the child. You have to, so uh, as I said, it's more important. It's important to know how they present and what is their medical management from the exam point of view. So because it can be a scenario in which you can be just asked like, okay, you met a you you are called in pediatric emergency to, to help with the airway of a child who is stooping forward, who's drooling, and who's making a strange noise like a spider. Uh, so you have to diagnose or support your diagnosis on the basis of that. And then you can say, okay, these are the medical uh, management points, okay? The main thing in the epiglottitis and both in the croup, I, I don't know if any of you have come across to intubate a child uh, for the transfer or for ventilation in your hospital. It's very common to have epiglottitis in the season, which is coming up here uh, in the viral, like the child would be getting viral illnesses uh, in this month, long, like closer to December. Uh, so so the, base, the basic uh, anesthetic management is that you, so they, as, as with the pediatric anesthesia, you know that the one of the most important thing when you come across any child for any surgery is that uh, in the pre-op is that you are making rapport with your with your patient and with your parents and this child is the minimum handling is the uh, key basic thing and you have to mention that in your answers uh, in the uh, in your viva or in the in the written question that minimal handling if the child doesn't have IV, doesn't matter. You don't need to attempt for IV and you don't need to ask people to attempt for IVs. 
the child need to be in most comfortable position if the child wants to be in mama, mother's lap or in dad's lap he needs to be there and you have to leave him there with the like with the thing like with the oxygen in nearby and with the monitor on chest monitor on or at least the chest exposed so that you can see the chest movement and you can access by your eyes visual assessment that is child doing okay so as i said minimal handling comfortable position child still need to be hydrated so if they want to drink a little bit let them drink if we can but as i said there there, there might not be possibility of getting an iv line in most of the times don't persist for iv line and this is a kind of a tricky question when you are asked this is the thing which you which you can be asked in short case in a viva that um, because it's like it's it 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 happens a lot so like i was called for a pediatric airway uh, in a ent emergency room and they were the child had the croup and then they wanted to get the iv line in and they said no 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 we need to blood, take blood but then you have to be persistent so same is the thing like then the your examiner can be can pretend to be a stubborn surgeon and he can get into the loophole of that and to the to drive into the thing that okay i'll put an iv line in and i'll try getting that no you have to be clear in your mind what is recommended and you need to stick with that so this is one more thing which i learn in uh, by doing the vivas that uh, sometimes the examiners are trying to miss not misleading like they are they are not trying to mislead you but they are trying to get you into that position when you face like actually facing that situation so so this is so I, as i said so comfortable position hydration if it's possible you don't let the you don't distract the child you don't distress the child you don't let them cry because they can go into the spiral of crying desaturation and then arresting as you know the most common arrest in the, in pediatric population is the respiratory arrest and they can have the cardiac arrest following that like hypoxia and the cardiac arrest so what the recommendations are is that if with the epiglottitis style if you so in the exam and in the practical life you have to be in the most comfortable position in the most comfortable environment you need to be you will ask the you will get ready with your theater basically so that is the exam answer as well and that's the practical answer as well you will need to be in your comfortable zone you cannot deal with a child in the pediatric emergency room if you are not familiar with the environment if you're familiar with the environment you know that everything gadgets and everything are available you can but not with epiglottitis epiglottitis child has to be gas down so you bring the child to the theater so this you, this is what you say and you have to prepare as well that i'll prepare my room i'll prepare my emergency drugs according to the weight of the child estimated weight of the child you know you all know the formulas for the estimated you have to prepare for your machine you are going to have a general anesthetic with inhalation and induction you have to a smaller tube size you have to prepare yourself for a difficult airway as well so these are the few points you need to mention that i in so examiner knows that you are thinking what are the possibilities what are the problems you are going to face small size tube a, a size smaller and a small uh, child right size of the tube and a bigger and a supraglottic airway just in case and then the front to neck um excess as well surgical while we are not doing it but say you know, like we need to get ready for those all things so i will prepare my theater i will prepare my drugs i will prepare my emergency drugs and i will prepare my uh anesthetic airway trolley for all so you have to mention all those and you do that in the uh, um real scenario as well so these as i said minimal handling so these kids are started with 100% oxygen and sevoflurane or halothane none other, no other inhalational agent don't try that you would say that i'm very good at iv and at anesthetic and i would i'm very so good at putting in ivs in the awake child that i put an iv in and put the give the proof for and that's it don't try to be a superman do what what is um, recommended in the cut so you so these 
so basic line is that you you have to elaborate your preparation and you say that you cast the child down with the fever fluorine your aim is to maintain the uh, spontaneous respiration till the time that you can manage that so you get this child deep and then you do a gentle laryngoscopy so you never give a muscle relaxant or a IV anesthetic or anything else before you are sure that you are able to see the glottis or your table of view. So that's what happened that you see a gentle. So there's stages, I think, so you all know who have worked in pediatric anesthesia that you can check the, when you are, when you're doing mask and then you lift the jaw, you know that you're able. So if the patient is tolerating the jaw lift, your patient can tolerate the LMA. So that's the thing. So you check your depth of anesthesia with your manipulation. And once you think your child is deep enough, your heart rate is nicely coming down and you have a good capnograph on the screen and SATS is on and the, your ECG is on every. So you are putting all these monitors after that. You would like to start with the SATS monitor at least if you can put it on if the child is not distressed. And then you will put the rest of the monitors on and then you are doing a gentle laryngoscopy, and if you are able to see, only then you can give a muscle relaxant to the child and then put the tube down. Okay, so this is the thing. Uh, there is one more thing which ne you need to mention and adapt in your practical life as well is the team briefing and talking to your colleagues, talking to your surgeon, and talking to your anesthetic nurse and anesthetic assistant. So if when you are saying in an exam, you have to mention that step that I will do a brief or I'll talk to my team and we'll make a plan. I'll tell them the plan and this is my plan, okay? So I will take them in my plan as well so that everybody is clear and there should be a closed loop communication. So these are the things I would highly recommend you all of you to adapt. This is the thing which we lack in Pakistan all of the time, not talking to each other, grumpy. <laughs> And aesthetic and grumpy, we're like I know, and I don't think so. And aesthetic that grumpy, but like uh, not talking to our colleagues, not talking to the surgeon. So, so these, uh, this is a very important step, which in your practical life and in your exam answer as well. I think so that you need to see say that that you so so your examiner knows that that's what you are thinking about. Okay, so this is epiglottitis, and um, so as is. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, that you have to mention the medical management of that. So medical management, if the ch child hasn't had the antibiotic, you will give the antibiotic, you will give the 0 0.115 to milligram per kilogram of dexamethasone and all that. And then you have to prepare for child transfer. As I said earlier, you have to assume yourself that you are in a perfect environment. So your, your examiner, sometimes they... They openly tell you that you are in a tertiary pediatric center. So tertiary pediatric center, it means that you have everything available or your child, you, or he would say that you're in a, in a peripheral hospital where you don't have the pediatric intensive care, but you need to transfer the child out. So you, so you manage by that, okay? So anybody who wants to ask the question in this scenario or want to suggest something or Dr. Zishan, if you want to contribute something on the side, because it might be, I am not saying that I'm 100% right. Please go ahead. Actually, <clears throat> my personally, I have never faced such scenario of this uh, particular titus and, but actually it, it should be a very challenging uh, scenario. Similarly, if you don't have IV lines and you are trying to um, like uh, have inhalational induction again, I have seen some people trying to to have a, a <clears throat> airway manipulation by putting LMA without without uh, taking IV line. Okay, so I don't think so. It's a safe practice because no, uh, no. I completely agree with you. So it's the recommended way of doing this is that you are making the child deep enough that he's gonna to tolerate the stimulation. You cannot yes. you cannot risk any spasm or uh, and desaturation at this stage. So you have to make the child deep first and then put an IV line in and then proceed with your uh, intubation thing. So this is the way it should be done practically and in the exams as well. Luckily, I have seen few scenarios of this. And uh, I would like to, uh, I would like, 
to ask you if there is anything which you think is recommended and i haven't haven't mentioned no no i think you have covered nicely <clears throat> actually these are more of practical uh, aspects uh, because in the books everything will be written but not been discussed in that way and that yes. is the that is the requirement for the people because I, I i will not mention the name i was just being asked about anzulises okay so anzulises there was a big confusion and in that uh, uh, resident that how to use the anzulises and actually anzulises is mandatory in every patient I, yes. I just uh, like <clears throat> even the people who are familiar of OR environment, they can get, get panic if they are on the other side of the table being a, yes. being a patient. Okay. So Anzulis yes. is mandatory. Similarly, like uh, you will not find the clear answer about airway management. So similar, th this is a very important thing that, and this also important with one more regard that actually when we do intubation or when we do airway manipulation, we need MAC bar, not MAC, because for IV uh, I, this IV, uh, you can say taking IV lines, it is just like you can say surgical, sort of you can say that it is like a surgical yes. stimulation. So you are poking with the needle. So that yes. will require MAC. But if you want to intubate or you want to have airway manipulation, you want even deeper level of anesthesia, you, yes. um, which you might not have actually achieved. And it is not safe till the time you don't have uh, IV line because in pediatric patient everyone is afraid of uh, uh, in adults uh, tachycardia but in pediatric with airway manipulation actually paradoxically bradycardia, bradycardia, will, bradycardia yeah. that will create uh, more problem so never mm -hmm. never in, try to intubate or put LMA before you have achieved the IV line this is the message no never no never yeah absolutely right that's good. And um, if everybody is happy or if, uh, if, if uh, anyone doesn't have a question about uh, the epiglottitis and the croup situation, uh, if somebody has sent a message here. You want to open your mic and just say it to everybody, please? Uh, beside clinical judgment, raise WBC concerns regarding postponing. Okay, that's from the previous uh, scenario. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So we'll we'll come to the next airway emergency. Um, that is a foreign body. Uh, I think so. Uh, I'm. Uh, uh, these all questions are basically. I don't. Uh, I don't think they are come as a long question in written exam, but they can be all part of the short time, short stem answers like the SPA, the single best answers. And they are part of the table viva definitely. I was asked uh, pediatric, I had a full table viva on the pediatric anesthesia when I was doing my my, FRC, my FCI, like a College of Anesthetics uh, Irish exam for anesthesia. So, and that he, I would like to actually share the whole scenario. If we get at the end at five minutes, I would like to share the whole question with you because that, that's how you get the question. You're not getting a question like you, a child presented with the foreign body. They, because they need to spend whole 15, 20 minutes on the short table viva. So it will be a mixture of two, three things. Like the child has some syndrome and has the foreign body. The child is obese and has foreign body. So it will be a mixture of the things so that all the things are covered up. Okay. So we're going to proceed to the foreign body. Uh, and uh, it's very common in Pakistan and it's very common everywhere where the children are. So the foreign bodies are basically, it can be uh, acute settings like the child can have a, just inhaled a foreign body and present it. And uh, it can be a settings in which the child has had the foreign body for few weeks and wasn't diagnosed initially and then come to the theater. And it's, it's, it's challenging both for the first physician like the ENT or the respiratory physician who is dealing with that and for the anesthetist as well. So if it's an acute scenario, it's usually with the respiratory distress, drooling, coughing, non-stop coughing, that's how child is presenting. And with the sensation, uh, with the sense of uh, dysphagia, dysphonia, distress. Usually, like parents even would just sense that there's something wrong with the child. Child would not say that I took a coin in. So you have to like the, that, that's the same with the 
physicians and with the anesthetist, you are going to sense with your examination, with your history, that what's wrong with this child. And if it's a long-term foreign body, like it's staying, staying there for, for a few weeks or days, then the child is going to present with a non-resolving chest infection. And then the, in that case, you don't know what's happening. So the most common foreign bodies, you all know, it's peanuts, beads, coins. I recently had a child who was doing this, this like, I, I just saw the coin. So putting the coin and so he had coins stuck in his, uh, so the kids, all those do these, all these things. The basic principles are same uh, in, in practical and in exam scenario as well. The basic principles are same for the foreign body and the epiglottitis or the group that you are doing less handling. You're not asking for IV line or bloods or anything before. Uh, you're not making the child distressed. You have the child in the comfortable position. There's somebody, some people say you can give some glycopyrrolide. I'm not giving, I, I haven't given it. I, I don't say, I want, I don't want to recommend that, that giving a glycopyrrolide for no reason. I know that your child is drooling, but you can suction it. That's no problem. So that's my, like, it's, it's so it's the same thing. So uh, be, be cautious what you're saying in exam. If you don't want to talk about the glycopyrrolates, drawbacks, and, uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages then don't talk about it at all and leave it to the examiner if he wants to ask you okay will you give them something for the secretions okay and then you can discuss okay but don't only uh, this is a safe way of uh, putting yourself in the exam talk about the things which you know and then leave it to the examiner if they want to uh, ask you anything further from that so as i said the uh, the things are the same you are doing the child in the in an aesthetic room and uh, you you are keeping so minimal monitoring in the start minimal monitoring to start with the pulse oximeter it gives you all the information it comes from your basic you can mention that or uh, or you you at least you should know that if you if you don't want to mention it that's another thing but it can be asked in an, another scenario that what information you are getting from the cytosmograph Okay, I, I don't know the XCPS candidates are still getting the uh, basic sciences questions in their vivas or not, but they used to ask the basic sciences questions in the viva when I was doing XCPS. So, and uh, as I said, so it, it will be again, it will be, so say, uh, can I ask somebody who's in, who, who, anybody who's having, doing an exam recently, can raise hand or unmute yourself, please. Say hello. I want to ask something. We are re approaching our time. Anybody, anybody who is preparing for exam? And Doctor Asma, I think we should preparing for exam. We should again appear in FCBS yes. exam because. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I'm name. appearing, ma'am. Okay. What's your name, please? Ma'am, I'm Dr. Azar Hussain. Dr. Azar Hussain. Are you do okay? So, are you doing final exam? Yes, ma'am. Uh, inshallah, uh, from uh, in the March next year, I'll be appearing for FPS. Okay. Say so. Okay. I'm just putting a scenario forward for the foreign body, and you can. Just say whatever you think about that or what you're in your mind. Say, they say, okay, so we don't know. The child comes in suspected foreign body, possibly a coin. They have x-rayed and the coin is sitting above the um, carina, definitely. And uh, so, you, so, so, so you, you're seeing it in the throat on the x-ray. And... You, the fasting is, mom says, oh, I don't know what he, he was just having some chips when I noticed that he was still coughing a lot. I thought some, he has choked on the crisp, but then he didn't stop coughing. So that's why I brought him to the Amy. So what would your plan, what, how will you approach this child? So this is a typical question. How would you approach this patient? Ma'am, uh, like this say? is uh, quite uh, uh, quite uh, a difficult uh, scenario. We have to 
uh, we have to definitely weigh the pros and cons of every approach. Uh, 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 definitely, uh, if the, we are not sure about the NPO timings of the child, mm -hmm. one, and in the distressful condition, definitely uh, stomach in time is slowed. So that we have to keep in uh, as a well bound. So uh, uh, basically, I will not take this child as an NPO, complete NPO. The uh, child is not completely NPO. First, my first concern will be this. Uh, well, uh, second concern will be uh, that uh, airway management, because uh, uh, I can uh, not uh, do the inhalational induction. Uh, so uh, I will. Uh, Will give if I have an IV line, I can put an IV line. I will give a small boluses of propol or like ketamine, and then I will try to give a small gauge, uh, small uh, smaller uh, airway line. Uh, sorry, uh, endotracheal tube. I will try to put an endotracheal tube with small gauge. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll thank you so much for contributing and coming forward. That's a huge thing. Everybody, that's, I used to be the same, like when we were sitting in the class or any tutorials or any lectures, I remember. Uh, I won't come forward and talk, okay? But always come forward and talk because in that way, it's a little bit of small practice of your exam because what happens to us that we don't, we are not able to talk in the exams. Even... You have 100 things to mention in your mind, but you cannot talk. So I would uh, thank you so much. And so I would like to say that, as I said, in by the exam point of view, you have to summarize your scenario. So I have a five-year-old child who has been, who hasn't like, whose NPO is not completed, or you don't say, you won't say these words. You would say, uh, I had a five-year-old child who has eaten something just maybe 10 minutes ago, so he is not fasting, okay? And then you say either he's the suspected foreign body, in an inhaled foreign body, most probably a coin, which can be seen in the X-ray and it's superclotting. And then you can describe your challenges. That my challenge is that your child is not fasted, as you said, thank you so much. And, and you said the second thing, uh, I, I won't agree with your technique and I would, I won't, I would recommend and suggest you to uh, only mention the things which are doable, which are recommended by the guidelines. As I said, there are all the um, sources have been shared with you in the Google Drive. And, uh, and that's why we are discussing here as well, to just to enhance the knowledge that uh, you, you won't say that I'm giving small propofol boluses and you never say that. Because if you want to talk about propofol, you have to talk about the dosages and right amount and whatever. Okay, so we'll, we'll just say, so foreign body, so as this child, so they say, yes, we, I would like to have a fasted child, but you have to say that is the child respiratory distress or not? If the child is choking, like literally choking, if the child is literally choking on that, then that's, that's, that's a different thing. So, but like the, uh, the, your first answer is that like, I would like to have this child fasted. And my approach is that, as I said earlier, that I would prepare my room, prepare my airway instruments, prepare my emergency drugs, prepare my anesthetic drugs. This is the point as well for the, your viva, that anesthetic drugs, emergency drugs, I'm prepared by airway trolley. And I discuss the plan with my team, with my anesthetic team and with my surgeon that how I'm going to proceed. And then we will bring in the child and we start with the minimal monitoring and we'll do the inhalational induction after the child is fasted. And, uh, and say, uh, if, if I'm an examiner, I would definitely ask, say if you did a laryngoscopy and you saw the coin just beside the uh, vocal cords, like near to like, no, it, it won't be sitting on the vocal cords, but it's just there in the closer to the larynx. What will be your next step? And it would like, it, would you like to answer that, please? The same uh, candidate. Sorry, I forgot your name. Anyone else? Well, well, ma'am. Uh... Dr. Uh, Adnan, uh, you sponge, rose your uh, hand uh, earlier. You said you are going to prepare, uh, preparing for exam as well. Can you answer this? Am I audible, ma'am? 
Yeah, yeah, you, I can hear you. Uh, your voice is gone now. Madam, uh, we uh, we will try to remove coin in single gentle attempt. Okay. Okay. That's fine, but I don't. Uh, so what is it? What is recommended? And what is the, your exam answer? Is that? Even if you see the coin in your vicinity, like in your on your first direct laryngoscopy, your aim is your to secure the airway. So you would you won't take an extra time. You have pre oxygenated your child only for the time of laryngoscopy. So you would go ahead and put the tube down, secure your airway. You won't touch the toy coin. And this is the exam answer. Don't be what you say. What's the word or the correct word of it that? like you just get attempt to take that out but you don't do that okay this is not recommended when if you're working even as a pediatric anesthetist i would recommend you to do that and if you are doing an exam question say no i would like to tube my child first secure my airway and let my or even if you want you want to do it i would like i would i would def, like safe answer is that i would like i would hand over my child to the ent surgeon or my um, physician like surgeon basically and i would let him do the uh, the procedure okay so this is your thing because whatever what, what can happen practically say if you try to you were tempted and you try to take the coin out you can cause trauma you can move it forward it can slip down and choke it completely obstruct your airway and your can child can even if you haven't dislodged it your child can desaturate anyway in the meanwhile because they were not breathing properly you, they were drooling, you, there were secretions in the mouth, and then uh, they are at risk of desaturation. So, and you, whatever medications you have given, like the deep anesthesia, when you're doing laryngoscopy, you're not doing, giving the uh, sevoflurane then. So you are losing your precious time of intubation. So that's the exam answer. But thank you so much for contributing and speaking up. So this is the foreign body, basically. It's usually a quick thing, and uh, then you can give your analgesia plan. Uh, and always include in your answer, the five, the stems of your answer should be my preparation, my patient's uh, interaction, what I'm doing with the patient interaction, what I'm asking in the questions, and, what, uh, what, and then my making my plan, preparing my anesthetic theater, and then close off your question discussing your analgesia plan with your antiemetics and destination of your child. I do remember it in the long case in the FCPS vivas, uh, always every patient was going at, at the end to the ICU because that's the kind of the pattern they had, like they want to ask the complications of that patient. So what if this patient is going to ICU? Okay, what are the post-op complications? So bring your child from the any department or from the ward and take it to the destination where they are supposed to be. So this is the part of your management. I know this is a huge drawback of our training, why we get these difficulties in exams that we are not doing those things in, the, in our real life. So that's why we completely forget to mention them when we are talking about them. We don't we don't prescribe, uh, I remember not prescribing analgesia for my parent patients when I was in Pakistan and avoiding it because we didn't know the paracetamol dose, we didn't know the bufen dose. We were like, okay, this is surgical team's uh, job, I'm not doing it. Do it for your parents, uh, not for, for your patient's sake, safety for yourself and because you will be getting in habit of talking these things. You will be getting in habit of thinking about those things when you're answering those questions. There's only, uh, it's going to be half, uh, it's going to be, uh, Dr. Sushant, do we have more time or we are finishing? We are finishing. Uh, only one thing finishing. I will tell, uh, I, I will just add on to this foreign body because majority of times, uh, we, if uh, foreign body removal is uh, sort of a trauma, okay? So even if they have removed it by uh, just putting their uh, rigid bronchoscope, even then you may, may, might need to, to put the endotracheal tube for some time. 
till the patient yeah, is yeah. awake. Yeah, so that's and... very important thing. I actually for like to didn't yes. miss that part at, uh, at all. Uh, that what is yes, your that's... airway? What how yes. you like what 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 Bus... airway you gonna put down? So most mm -hmm. commonly the for uh, like during the laryngoscopy is like if, if micro laryngoscopy is foreign body removal. How it's, this is your way as well? How you're gonna maintain your airway? So you're doing you did the started with the mask. But then you're putting a nasal tube down your, and you just left, le left, it, leave it behind the uvula, Be leave it behind the epiglottis that you can see it, but it's not in the way of the ER surgeon. And other way of doing it is ventilation through the heart, like the rigid bronchoscope that you have a port. You need to know that if it's a rigid bronchoscopy and I can ventilate it either through the nasal airway. Or I can, you are using that tube as a nasal airway. So you are putting the tube down the nose and just, it's, sit, it's sitting just in the nasopharynx. You are not putting it down the uh, trachea. Or the other way of ventilating your child is through the uh, ventilating out, um, end of the rigid bronchoscope. Sorry, I, I thank you for so much for mentioning that and I completely forgot. Somebody has his ha hand up and they don't have their name on. Uh, would you like to say something? This is the Somebody, this is the most uh, favorite name in the world iPhone. Everyone loves iPhone. iPhone. Yeah, so yeah, they don't they have name <laughs> iPhone, but but do you want to say something? You can unmute uh, yes. yourself. Yes, uh, Doctor Asma. One one more point. I just want to ask that uh, I like mention that uh, majority of times after removal of foreign body, or uh, just to sim uh, almost similar scenario with the when they are doing this uh, diagnostic bronchoscopy, okay? For yeah. some other reason, but the, uh, even after removal of foreign body and after this bronchoscopy, patient coughs a lot. Yeah. There, there is a lot of incidence of cough after, especially if foreign body is uh, slightly down the, down the hill in the airway and they are removing it. So after that, uh, or if it is, for example, a fragile, not a, a like a compact thing like a coin. It may yeah, be a peanut. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, so it's, so as I said, as yes. Yeah. So as I said, as, sorry, like like I we were dis discussing all all the scenarios. So I like I didn't go into the detail of each and every step. But so they are coughing. So there is one more recommended thing which is written in the like in the article as well uh, in the pediatric anesthesia that when when you're doing this thing uh, because it can be very stimulant and irritative to the airway to prevent the cough afterwards and during and helping the stress response during the surgery they say that you have to you can use the lignocaine so i'm like we normally using 1% lignocaine but it's written as a 4% lignocaine but you have to always once you mention the lignocaine all the candidates i would like to say do mention that you would keep in mind the maximum dose you can use so it's the lignocaine spray. You can when you're doing the laryngoscopy, you do the lignocaine spray onto the laryngeal inlet. This is your first spray. You can come out and do the mask again and let your child have some more oxygen, and then go in again and do a second spray onto the cords. And then there's a third spray which is beyond the cord. So this is the three sprays you have to do for micro laryngoscopies and. Um, I won't do it for the foreign body uh, if it's if it's up in the like if it's higher in the tracheal tree if it's lower down and you think your child is gonna cough a lot I yeah I would I, I would probably would just give the spray to the vocal cords uh, so that has I, actually I, I I had a child uh, a baby a four year old baby this is a scenario uh, which we which I came across a four a three or four year old baby who had a mouthful of peanuts handful of peanuts and mouthful of peanuts and her mom his mom tried to take the peanuts out and was like oh take it out take it out but child got upset and he started crying and in crying he inhaled all the peanut pieces inside so so it was not a single foreign body it was just he it was everywhere in his lungs so that child ended up ended up in icu so yes I, as i said uh, you have to talk about your destination of the child. So once the foreign body is removed, you have to assess that is your child is once you uh, take off the like your child is 
spontaneously breathing, you have to auscultate your chest, is the child desaturating or not? So discuss all those things. And uh, you need to know that your child, if your child was respiratory distressed preoperatively, you might need to keep your child intubated. And as I said, again, you have to think that you are in the, in a perfect environment. If you, if your, say your, uh, say your examiner say, no, you, you don't have pediatric in intensive care. Then you said, I would still like to be, uh, leave him in the theater. Like you can even keep the patients ventilated in the theater. That happens a lot of the times in here and in Pakistan. Uh, that if you don't have the, uh, but you won't extubate the child. Don't say that I, even with the respiratory distress, I would uh, extubate the child and leave him die. Uh, we, I will conclude here. We'll close the session. I would like to do another session. <laughs> Sometime, maybe next month or in a few weeks' times, I can collaborate with uh, Dr. Yuzhan. And thank you so much for everybody to, for listening. And if you want to say something, uh, please go ahead and then we can say. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank Dr. First. Asma because uh, you are the second person who has uh, uh, contributed before, uh, I, I rather third person because Bilal Tufel is one of them. And before that, one of our senior consultant from Canada, he he actually uh, conducted one session. Uh, um, you know, th this is uh, because the biggest deficiency in my career is that I, I have not worked in Europe. Okay, whatever experience I have taken in King Faisal, but still I am. You can say I am a hybrid desi anesthetist. Mashallah, you are working there, and people are attracted more. But and and you know your words mean a lot. So I will be very happy and I will Thank be very so thankful much. to you that whenever possible for you, do contribute, okay? Because Thank whatever I'm Thank doing you. it is for purely for the sake of development of uh, the like vision. You know, all of them are intelligent. You were, you know, yeah. I was in Pakistan. You were in Pakistan. Just imagine, say thanks to Allah that we, are, we have got the chance to work out of that system. And you are in you are in UK. I am in Saudi Arabia, and we we just it was just our luck that we, we got a chance. Yes, we worked hard, but they all the people sitting back in Pakistan they have the potential. Unfortunately, they the potential. They, do, they don't. They, there are two problems. One problem they are not being guided. This is one problem. The other problem they don't want to be guided because they are not interested. They never join. They never are. They are they are sitting uh, in their grooves. Happy, waiting for a miracle to happen unfortunately no, and, and i would i would really uh, uh, you know when i decided to come and join your group at the moment and <laughs> we had a conversation remember yes that i really want my pakistani doctors to think differently because uh, what we have come across i come across we were doing something else in the anesthetic rooms and we were saying something else in the vivas so this is not the way of doing your practice and you fail exam as well because you have to say what is recommended and this is I think so that is the blessing uh, when I came here and I completely saw the different way of doing things because in Pakistan this is our general uh, our habit of every Pakistani oh we can get away with doing things we can get away without oh I saw the coin I'll take it out and meri badi wawa hogi so no, you 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 might be doing that thing in the practical scenario. Don't do that. I would highly request and suggest don't do that. But always try to think, try to do the things. Even even a very small thing. We never pre like it was a just one Sheikhzad hospital in Lahore. I we used to do our pre ops, and it was compulsory for us to do the pre ops. Doctor Vasim Smith, he's retired now. He would like us to do our pre ops. Nobody is doing pre-ops in Pakistan. Maybe some people are doing it very good. So, but you as a trainee, make your habit, seeing your patients before, after making your plans in your head, according to the guidelines, think this is your exam question. And this is what is going to come in the exams. The same person, we have so much patients in Pakistan. The exam scenarios are there. We have big goiters in Pakistan. We get that exam scenario all the time. We don't see large goiters in Europe or in Saudi Arabia. I don't think so. So you are blessed in a way that you see all those things and you can you see them firsthand. You're not seeing them in the books. You're seeing a goiter 
a foreign body and all those things firsthand. You can see them, discuss them. And I, anybody who uh, like, I would I really um, like if, if, if anybody wants an advice or whatever, I am there to help. And th thank you so much, Dr. Zishan. I would uh, say goodbye now. Allah Hafiz, everybody. Yes, okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks Allah a lot all you for joining. Yes, please, yeah. You want to say something? I think this was Dr. Munawar from Sheikh Zaid. So she also wanted to say hi to you, I think. <laughs> oh, Thank you so much, Dr. Asma. Yes. Okay. Okay. Dr. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Inshallah, Thank you. Hope to see all of you Thank soon you. again. Bye-bye. Love it.